All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, and welcome to uh, the ninth Empiricist League, the rise of the super brain. Thank you all for coming out. We appreciate it. Sorry about getting you guys in here a little bit late, but we are starting only six minutes uh, late as far as our speakers, so not too bad. Um, anyone ever been here before with the Empiricist League? Two of us, okay. Who's here for the first time? All right, cool. How would you guys hear about it? NPR. NPR. I had a feeling NPR was going to be a part of the, uh, the crowd tonight. We've got a great show. We've got three great speakers uh, all on uh, this topic of the rise of the super brain. Um, I suggest to all of you, if you have a good time, uh, you can go look up here. We have our, uh, our URL, which has a mailing list sign up. It has uh, our Facebook page and our Twitter handle. You can go on there and you can find out about uh, other events that we're doing. We usually do these once every couple months, uh, often here at Over the Eight as well. So check it out and thank you guys for, for coming. Uh, and with no further ado, let's uh, start with our very first speaker. Uh, <clears throat> Dan Hurley is a science journalist who has been covering the field of cognitive enhancement for the past three years. Uh, he has written for the New York Times Magazine on computer training units that increase food intelligence and the use of transcranial direct current stimulation to improve intellectual abilities. In January, he published his new book, Smarter, The New Science of Building Brain Power, as well as an article in TheAtlantic.com about sex and IQ. Uh, Mr. Hurley will speak to me personally about how to separate out the self-help baloney from the reliable science in this fast-evolving field. And before Dan comes up, I just want to uh, point out to you there, if you get inspired during the talk and you just cannot wait to buy his book, you can simply type his URL into uh, your phone and you can download your Kindle version of the book in a few short clips. So I highly suggest you guys do that. Uh, and with no further ado, let's please give a big welcome to Dan Hurley. Thank you. Uh, David, I want to thank you and uh, Karen Ingram for of the Empiricist League for putting this program together. Thank you to uh, After the Eight. And I want to thank uh, the two speakers who I invited to join me, uh, Jason Chine came from Philadelphia, and Zach Hambrick came from Michigan today uh, to to speak here to all of you. So I really want to thank, thank them for being here. Um, and I promise I will get to uh, sex and brain zapping, but you're going to have to wait for it. Um, it's not always that way. Um, so back in third grade, uh, I couldn't read. This is uh, uh, a 60s Teaneck, uh, New Jersey, uh, Mrs. Browning's class at Whittier School. And she told my mom, Daniel is a slow learner. And I can remember uh, at one point, and I can still picture where I was when uh, I'm sitting in this chair and she's like, what? You know, she's trying to get me to read a sentence. She points at a word and I go, to he. And she's, she said, no, that's the. And so I still literally remember the moment I learned to read the word the. And, you know, and you know, I was in a slow, slow reading group, a slow math group. And you sit, you know, I found myself sitting at lunch with the, you know, the dumb kids or something. And you know, I think anyone who's ever had a kid that is in this kind of situation or has gone through it, it's, it's really not fun. And um, yet when, by sixth grade, I was a straight A student. And for me, what happened in between was um, uh, this guy, Sam, Dan, take a bow, please. Dan Fegelson. Okay, so he was my best friend. We met when I was four, and he lived down the block. And he was, you know, reading like, I don't know, I think he was reading at two or something. And, uh, you know, his house was filled with books, and they played classical music, and they had a chess board, and they had a painting by Modigliani on going up the stairs. And, you know, and in my house, the TV was on and people were yelling at each other. And so uh, he started getting obsessed with comic books, with Spider-Man. And him and this other kid started reading and drawing their own comics. And so to stay 
friends with him, I said, I've got to get in on this. And I started reading comics and drawing my own comics. And, you know, by sixth grade, I'm like this straight A student. So it's always been a very weird experience for me because I was actually convinced that I was, like, you know, dumb or something. And then I became, you know, oh, I'm smart. And I was like, well, which is it? Did I actually get smarter? So if you had asked intelligence researchers 10 years ago, you would have to have been, they would have had to have been the most dewy-eyed, liberal, progressive thinkers to have claimed that you could increase intelligence. Because a lot of studies had been done trying to show that you could, and they kept not working. Even, you know, uh, uh, de Blasio's very big on, on universal preschool, which is great for many, many, many things, but research says that it's not going to literally make kids much smarter. Uh, and, and so the question is, you know, can you? And until 10 years ago, the, the general conclusion was, well, it must be genetic. It's really basic to who you are. And this kind of thinking is really uh, going back uh, nearly 100 years ago, the whole eugenics movement, which first cropped up in Britain, then came over the Atlantic here to the United States, where a lot, all the groups, like all the family planning groups now that are, are ex exist in a lot of the genetics groups that exist, all had their roots as eugenesis. And so they, there were tens of thousands of unintelligent people who were forcibly sterilized here in the US. And of course, that movement then went back across the Atlantic, and the Nazis, who didn't just sterilize people, but you know, murdered them. So, a lot of evil has been done in the name of, like that intelligence can't be changed, and you're born that way, and that's all there is. Um, I even interviewed a guy, Sig Puchel, who ran a Down syndrome program, uh, first at Harvard and then in Rhode Island. When he was trying to come over, he had been invited by Harvard to come over. He had a son with Down syndrome. And the US Immigration Service would not allow him in because he had a son with Down syndrome and we don't want people who are unintelligent you know, spoiling our beautiful country because we're so smart here. And uh, still to this day, actually, it, those laws remain on the books. Uh, a Ted Kennedy had to intervene to get Sig Puchel and his son in, but, and he said, well, we're going to change those laws, but they have not changed, uh, which, is, which is a little scary. So, given this view of intelligence, it's not surprising that a lot of people have turned against the whole value of intelligence as, you know, something to care about. So we've had Dan Goldman write, emotional intelligence and say, well, no, really, your ability to control your emotions and be sensitive and in, in touch with your feelings, that's much more important. And then we've had Malcolm Gladwell say in, in Outliers that uh, your, your, your willingness to work hard and uh, the community you're brought up in, that's much more important. And we had Paul Tuff's book last year, How Children Succeed, and he's saying grit and determination, that's what it's all about. So the <clears throat> those are all reassuring messages, and there's a great deal of truth. We all know people who are emotional clogs who are impossible to work with, and you know, unless they have some special skills, they don't go for. And obviously, determination and hard work are huge. But when you step back and think about what is the message of these books, they're basically saying that if you work hard and you play well with others, everything will be fine. And in my experience, that's absolutely not the real world. That we all know, as I knew back in third grade, that there are people that are brighter and there are people that are less bright. And we, we see that in our friends and our family and at work. And, and it's, a, it's a very real thing, that ability to learn and think straight. So six years ago, this study came out 
that turned the whole field upside down. I mean, it wasn't as, I think people that are really know the field know it wasn't quite as dramatic as I have portrayed it to be, but it was a big deal. This uh, study came out that said, you do this task called the end back, and you do it for 10 and a half hours over five weeks, and your fluid intelligence increases by 40%, okay? So that study came out, and the whole field was like hitting an anthill. And since then, there have been dozens and dozens of studies in this field. Let me un try to unpack what, what those terms mean of fluid intelligence and the end back. <clears throat> Most of us think of short-term and long-term memory when we think of intelligence. And these two things turn out to really not be very closely related to measures of like IQ and intelligence. So people that are really good at remembering a lot of facts, mm, that's, that's good, that's, that's a useful skill, but when you look at studies of does that correlate with their intelligence, not very well. Which is why, you know, there are people, and we all know them, who have encyclopedic memories of knowledge of certain little areas, but maybe they're not really deep thinkers. Um, so working memory is where this whole field has gotten very excited about. Working memory is your ability to juggle facts and manipulate them and play with them, sort of like if you had a deck of cards on a table and you move them around and you turn some of them over so you don't see them and flip them back and still remember what they are. It's kind of like the difference between if you remember, a, like I remember Dan's phone number from the 60s, 8332055. And that's like, okay, that's easy. Uh, but what if I said, tell me that number backwards, 8332055. Makes you go, mm, uh, and, and what if I ask you to multiply 833 times 2055. That's where your mind starts go melting down and going, I can't do that. Because, you know, you can multiply the three by the five and get 15 and you put down the five and you carry the one, but now you're no longer remembering what's that number there. And when you come back, you're not remembering what that number is on the bottom. So people with really good working memories are able to do this kind of stuff better than people with less strong working memories. And Dan Fegelson has a really unique ability. Uh, I'm sorry to keep abusing him in this way, but he can say any word, and he's been doing this since high school, he can say any word that you tell him backwards, immediately, uh, like Dan. What is the word backwards, backwards? Oh, gosh. What is it? Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Exactly. And that is kind of a demonstration of working memory, that you're able to see a word and then almost flip it and read it backwards. That's crazy. Um, so the NBAC is a test. Some people debate how good of a test of working memory, but it's one of them. Uh, uh, again, some say yes, some say no. So NBAC is like, how many times ago am I asking you to remember the, the item that I said? So if I say one back, that means I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand when I repeat a word twice, or if I repeat a letter twice. So if I go K, P, Z, Z, up uh, the second Z, that's one back. Two back requires a little more thinking. It's pretty easy, but if I go N, A, Q, L, Q, A, L, Q, N, L, N, that's two back. Three back is where it starts getting scary. And most people, when they see it on a computer, 
just want to throw the computer across the room. Uh, let me read you a three back sequ a sequence and see if you can keep track of where the threes repeat. It means that it's the same letter from three times ago. L, Q, N, Q, A, N, L, A, Q, A, L, Q. Okay, so a few, a few of you got it. Uh, when you see these coming at you, and people have done uh, these, many of these early studies with, with a, a double version, you're seeing like a uh, tic-tac-toe board, and squares are lighting up, and you've got to remember which squares lit up three times ago, as well as the letters coming. And they're unrelated to each other. So it's really madness. Um, so the idea was, if you practice on this test of NBAC, you could get, you would increase your working memory, and thereby increase your fluid intelligence. And the claim seemed to be that folks thought they were getting inside kind of the machinery of how your mind is working. And like you could practice on that just like practicing push-ups and pull-ups and such. Um, so since that study came out, there have been, now it's nearly 100 studies have come out. When I wrote my book, it was about 75 that I found. It's now up to about 100. And um, Jason is one of the people that has published studies, some of them showing similar, similar results. Not always on fluid intelligence. That's one of the more difficult. Only about one, I, I found about 22 studies that showed increase in fluid intelligence. Some do, some don't. Others show improved reading ability, comprehension, problem solving, this, that, and the other thing. Um, Zach has published studies showing, for the most part, that it's a bunch of malarkey. He believes that, and, and, and I'm, really, I'm really delighted that both of these guys are here because these guys are sort of like the click and clack of car talk, of the ability to get inside that engine and tell you if it's going to get you where you want to go. Like when the woman calls in and goes, I'm moving to Nebraska, because my boyfriend went there, is my, is my 82 Buick going to get me there? And these guys know how to drill down into the, into the studies. Um, but I'm also, you know, as a journalist, uh, you know, I've been doing science journalism for 25, 30 years. And you really get used to the fact that there are significant debates. It's not just like when intelligence, when, when Zach says, gee, we're not sure, we disagree, we, we don't see it. Um, this is in every area of medicine, in diabetes medications. My previous book was about diabetes medications. And, and there are studies that were conducted in 1970 that look like, well, this drug just doesn't work, it's just not good for you, diabetics should not take it. And the whole uh, diabetes establishment went crazy saying, how dare you, this is the best drug we've, we've got. And they're still having that debate. Yeah. Ah! Okay, so um, I'm going to say that, bottom line, to say that this stuff is bogus, to say that it's nonsense, is crazy. It is absolutely, this is not cold fusion. It's not um, a kooky dietary supplement. This is real science that uh, a lot of researchers are using. Military is funding it. I've been in, you know, uh, we were talking earlier about these, uh, where you need special privileges to get into these military installations to listen to scientists present these studies. Um, I uh, decided to test many of these methods on myself. Now, working memory training is the big one, and I did uh, three and a half months of doing the end back, and I got up to like five back uh, pretty consistently. Uh, I also joined a boot camp exercise class, because exercise has been shown to be really effective. 
especially for children, especially for older people. So the fact that schools do not have as many uh, physical exercise programs for kids is really worrisome, and uh, obviously the obesity epidemic is is a frightening aspect because it's also like, uh, you know, your your uncle Fred is is not going to be thinking very straight as as he gets diabetes and such. Um, music training. I learned to play the Renaissance lute. Um, that was fantastic, and um, I did mindfulness meditation. And I lasted for two weeks because I was being driven crazy by my family. I tried commercial services. I tried, there's one called Cognad, which I think is perhaps useful for people like people with cognitive disabilities. It's been studied with Down syndrome and ADHD and people recovering from chemo brain and such. Um, but much less expensive, expensive was Lumosity. So I tried that for three and a half months. I also tried a nicotine patch. And yes, I got my brain zapped with uh, transcranial direct current stimulation. You can see it online. There are uh, uh, examples of people doing it at home, which is very frightening, I think, and they're out of their minds. Uh, uh, I did it at a Harvard lab. I also, a guy at, at uh, University of Pennsylvania showed me how it's done. And uh, the effects there are really startling because unlike most of the other methods, um, which all seem to take a lot of effort, and they're all about getting better, like progressively. And most of these things, the working memory training, the music training, the physical exercise, they're all supposed to get harder as you get better. So just doing crossword puzzles over and over doesn't seem to work where getting better and pushing and moving forward seems to be critical. But the, the, the brain zapping thing, like you're just sitting there and like you're doing the tasks better. It's, it's, it's a little bizarre. Um, the other one I promised you, sex. So there are studies that show, in mice at least, that when they have sex, that there's increased neurogenesis, uh, a formation of new brain cells, but uh, some interesting studies show that unless they're learning new tasks, that those brain cells are not you know, useful and they just die. Because we all generate new brain cells every day. Uh, but you've got to use them or you lose them. So I think that this stuff is really useful. I think it's really promising. These guys are very close to it. I step back and I go, I see so many studies in so many different areas that keep coming back with positive findings, even though there are some significant studies that show no benefit, that uh, it begins to be incomprehensible. Uh, it just doesn't seem possible that it, it's nothing. Um, and you know, the six-year-old uh, girl that I have at our, at our home, we have a foster child who just moved in with us in August. And uh, her mom didn't reach or didn't send her to kindergarten. So we have to start sending her to kindergarten a year late this September. Um, watched a lot of TV, wasted a lot of time, and now uh, we're going to enroll her in Cognab. We're going to uh, we're get we're going to get her piano lessons, soccer lessons, and you know I I uh, definitely believe that it's possible for a little child like this to grow and for you know, to blossom, and I hope that's true for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Do you guys have any questions for Dan? Oh, yeah, sure. Two quick things. One is you mentioned luminosity. Luminosity, yes. You didn't say anything about whether that was effective. And then so I, I, did Luma I did luminosity, and I did all of these things. It's called luminosity <laughs> for some reason. And all of them, I, you know, I wasn't doing a scientific experiment on myself. I wanted to jump in the water and see how it felt and get a sense of it and get like a granular level of what is it like to do all this stuff and did I see any effect. So my fluid intelligence after all that, according to the, the gold standard, Ravens, increased 16%. Now on some other tests, I didn't hardly increase. 
So it was like, well, did I or didn't I? I thought I did. Uh, I certainly felt more on a lot. And I'll tell you that spending your evenings playing the loot and doing computer games and meditating and exercising in the morning certainly makes you feel more alive than watching another rerun of Jackass. <laughs> Practicing recombinatory memory uh, is, is a key to increasing intelligence. Do you think, in retrospect, your childhood comic book reading and memorizing vast fictional universes might have made the secret origin happen that made you superhumanly intelligent after being dumb earlier on? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, a lot of this, and uh, we had dinner beforehand, and, you know, a lot of this, there's a lot that remains very mysterious about intelligence. Um, there's endless debates, researchers, the people that know the most, I think, are sometimes to listen to them, you'd go, wow, these, they're confused, they don't know. So, but to some degree, I think there's a level at which it's, you know, that old fake it till you make it. Like people that behave intelligently kind of are by definition, intelligent. So if you're reading and you're doing those things, at some level, I think it, it certainly, I mean, I know that reading, you know, changed my life. No, I have no doubt about that. And uh, I, uh, you know, I don't know, was I less intelligent beforehand? It seemed so to everybody, the, to the teacher. So I don't know what the heck happened. We have a but, I'm not that familiar at all with what the test actually tests for, but how does this improve actual life performance? So I, I get that I get that you perform better on the specific test, right. but how does it? And, I, and how do you mm -hmm. test that? So it's a great question because this is one of the. You know, it's very easy. It's it's hard enough for psychologists to do a five week study where we test you beforehand. We do this whole thing, we randomize it, and we're, we're giving the other people an active thing, so it's not just like a, an effect of a placebo effect. And then we test them afterwards on these sophisticated tests that psychologists have spent 100 years developing. So then to go, well, wait a minute. Are they really smarter? Can they write a book better? Can they read better? Do they, do they learn better? Well, how do you do that study, right? So do we have to wait until they're dead to decide whether they're really, were they really truly smarter? Um, a lot of studies seem to say, well, let's wait a year. And there's been a bunch of studies that have gone six months, followed up six months, followed up a year. Uh, uh, Jason has done studies that showed improved reading, I think reading comprehension. Uh, there's a lot of studies that are more real world and look like it's a real skill. But um, it's very, uh, there's, this is a problem with all of medicine, you know, where, where we have an endpoint, but then it's like we lowered your cholesterol, but did you live longer? Well, that's what we really care about. Well, we, lowered, we did lower your cholesterol, but you didn't live longer. What happened? You had as many heart attacks. So this is a, a universal problem in all these medical studies where people just, usually what they do is when they really think they've got something, then they start developing these really big studies. They're really, they take a long time, they're really expensive, and they're really complicated. So I think that's where the field is headed. But there's been so many studies now of, like I, I was joking at dinner, if there's another study of 37 people, I'm going to scream because they've done so many of those. And what they need is a study of 400 people that goes out a year and has all sorts of real world uh, outcomes. Yes. Ah! Oh. Do you think something like lumosity has the potential to develop 
larger scale data that's going to be useful and lead to a kind of mental fitness for the group? Well, it, the question is, you know, could Lamar City provide useful large data on people? They're doing that. They claim to have, you know, they've got 40 million people who have used it. And they've got, it's all on their computers, right? So it's crazy amount of data. And I am at, and I, they've published studies showing, for instance, that, you know, people that say that they drink a couple few times a week tend to perform better than people who say they never drink, which is sort of music. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of absurd. Uh, but, um, uh, there's no question that that academics are going to want to con uh, get inside their database, and I'm sure they're very, very protective of it because they're they are a business. Uh, you, you know, they they uh, I I doubled my I went from about a fifth like a median I was like dead average when I started, and I got up to like the 93rd percentile by the time I was done. Now, did I get twice as smart? No way. Uh, but they have so many tasks. That's one thing that's cool about it. They have so many.